Spoiler alert, I really like this study Bible. this study Bible before when I picked it up at a charity a thrift shop in Northwest Ohio for three dollars brought it home because uh, my perusal of the book at the thrift shop uh, impressed me enough that I thought I wanted to take a closer look at it possibly do a review which is what we're doing today and then uh, maybe donate it to my church or to a family at my church that might find it useful. What we have is the Learning Bible. It's in the Contemporary English Version translation, which if you have watched my channel from way back, I think I've discussed before, I have one of their paperbacks here. This one has the Deuterocanonical slash Apocryphal books. And I kept it for that reason, so I could compare those translations of Tobit, for instance, with some that I have, the King James or the Jerusalem Bible, for instance. But uh, this Bible here has only the um, Protestant canon of Scripture, so it uh, does not include those that uh, Protestants tend to call the apocryphal books. So what this is, is a basically a study Bible. It doesn't say that on it, but the Learning Bible is a study Bible in every sense. First of all, a word on the translation. The Contemporary English Version, I'm going to go to their description of it here at the beginning. I think it's the same introduction as is in the, uh, the other Bible I just showed. Uh, it opens with a song of praise for the King James Bible. The most important document in the history of the English language is the King James Version of the Bible. To measure its spiritual impact on the English-speaking world would be more impossible than counting the grains of sand along the ocean shores, etc., etc. Uh, every attempt has been made to produce a text that is faithful to the meaning of the original. Um, but what's the contemporary English version like? Um, they talk about the reason for this translation. Today, more people hear the Bible read aloud than read it for themselves. And statistics released by the National Center for Education indicate that almost half of U.S. adults have very limited reading and writing skills. If this is the case, a contemporary translation must be a text that an inexperienced reader can read aloud without stumbling, that someone unfamiliar with traditional biblical terminology can hear without misunderstanding and that everyone can listen to with enjoyment because the style is lucid and lyrical. Um, I guess you can be the judge of how they fulfilled those three criteria. I think they succeeded probably on the first two, maybe fell short on the third. The contemporary English version is quite easy to read, and... They have made it so that when you read it aloud, in places where it may have been unclear, their translation provides clarity. There is an example they have here. In the hearing of a translation, even the inclusion of a simple word like and can make a significant difference. Matthew 2.9 of the CEV reads as follows. The wise men listened to what the king said and then left. And the star they had seen in the east went on ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And, at the beginning of the second sentence, assists both the person who reads the text aloud and those who must depend upon hearing it read. Like all other punctuation marks, the period after left is silent, and so the text without and could possibly be heard as the wise men listened to what the king said and then left the star they had seen in the east. However, as the text now stands, the oral reader must pause briefly for a breath before and, which will signal the hearer that a new sentence has begun. They also uh, talk about the way they have laid out the 
psalms in this book, and we can look at that further on in. Um, I won't uh, bore you with that. So, first of all, as I gave away in the spoiler, I really like this study Bible. Much more than I like the translation of the contemporary English version. This learning Bible is, from what I can tell, no longer in print. But you can find copies of it in hardcover or in softcover like this is on eBay. And I'm sure lots of other booksellers for under $20 shipped. And is it worth that? I'm going to say yes, if you are the type of person for whom this book was written. I don't feel I'm the target audience for this book, but I can see a need for a book like this. Um, first of all, just the physicality of it. I've been sitting... Um, I've had it for several weeks now, and I just will sit on the sofa or uh, before bed and just have it in my lap. It lays open nicely. The print is beautiful. Um, easy to read, not just in the main text, but in the notations on the side. It is a study Bible for someone who is maybe unfamiliar with study Bibles and largely unfamiliar with the scripture itself. And it's a big boy. It is a big book. Let's talk about that. Seven inches by nine and a quarter. And a little, well, about two inches thick. And that's a paperback. <clears throat> and it is heavy. I like that it comes with this little guide. So someone new to the faith or unfamiliar with scripture, um, just the real basics, like how to look up a reference, the book title, the chapter, the verse, uh, has a, a Bible books and abbreviations and what page to find them on. This little bookmark you just kind of keep in your, in your Bible, um, has a, um, uh, directory for the many articles that are throughout. There's it says over a hundred mini articles, and there's a, uh, inside there's a um, list of those, a chart that tells you where to find each of them. Boy, it's having a hard time focusing on that. And then at the bottom, there's a guide to symbols that are used throughout the book in the notations, which we will look at momentarily. So let's go to that now. So on every page, the notations are on the side rather than at the bottom, although there are some um, more translator notes at the bottom of the page and kind of the study Bible material on the, the uh, outer margin on, on both pages. And each of the notations has a symbol that indicates what type of notes you are reading. So for instance, this little symbol represents uh, something about geography. This one, people and nations, objects, plants and animals, history and culture, ideas and concepts, cross-references. So I don't know that you necessarily need to know that as you're reading through it, but uh, if you're the type of person that looks for that type of helpful information, there it is in your little bookmark you can have with you. The notes are written to a level that is appropriate to the simplicity of the translation. So for me, it's not a superbly helpful collection of notations. Uh, not as, um, you know, certainly not textual, critical, scholarly types of notations, and that maybe is a good thing, but uh, for a young person or a new Christian, uh, it's written just about right. Um, at the beginning, there are some introductory materials, but not a ton. Talking about English Bible translations, how the Bible got to us, there's a chart that uh, shows the 
canon of scripture according to the three major traditions, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. There's a chart somewhere here that shows the family tree of English Bible translations and Here we are, and a, kind of a complicated chart and maybe not overly useful, but it gives you some idea where your translation falls on the family tree. Here we have an illustration and there are illustrations throughout. We'll look at some of those. Good old William Tyndall uh, being martyred, father of English Bible translation. So we have an introduction to the Old Testament and an introduction to the New Testament. Then there are section introductions, in this case, the Pentateuch, introduction to the Pentateuch, and then there are book introductions within that. So introduction to the book of Genesis. And then one of the things maybe that I would count as a negative regarding this particular book, um, full disclosure. So here's the end of the book introduction. How is Genesis constructed? Genesis can be divided into two main parts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there's some notes about the this portion of Genesis, and then we go into the text of Scripture itself with Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The font is different from the introduction to the text of Scripture similarly sized but a different font but is it enough different so that you realize or a newcomer to the bible would realize i'm moving from the editor's notes to the text of scripture um, i don't know i think maybe they could have made it a little bit more obvious certainly you see the chapter number there at the beginning that would give you a hint but if you're not familiar with the uh, format of Bible printing that may be a little confusing for you. And every page has lots of notes in these different categories. People and places, geography, objects, history and culture, etc. And this wonderful art that is throughout from ancient um, Renaissance to modern art, along with some photographs and uh, illustrations, presumably by the editors themselves. But fine works of art that give a sense to a reader, a new reader of scripture that um, the Holy Bible is important and it's interesting, it's fascinating and has been fascinating and important to people for thousands of years. And they've been making art about it for that long and look at the magnificent art that it has inspired. And so I think that's a terrific thing just on a subliminal level to teach a young person or a someone new to the faith or to the scriptures. Here we have something from uh, Abraham and the three angels, sometime from the uh, 1200s, early 1200s. Every page has cross references at the bottom of the notations. Jacob's Ladder from the 1960s. Paper is, there's a little bit of ghosting, but it's really white paper and the print is nice and big. I just love the format of this. And I understand how perfect this would be for the target audience, realizing that I likely am not the target audience, but I still enjoyed flipping through this over several days, just holding it in my lap. List of Egyptian kings, 13th century mosaic. Skip ahead some. You can see that there is art and notations throughout, but the um, the translation itself. Again, not the biggest fan of. I'm not the intended consumer for that. So for the market and the person that it was intended for, 
I give it a enthusiastic thumbs up. Now, in terms of the flavor of where this, the notations, well, the translation and the notations would fall kind of on the um, conservative orthodox to textual critical, uh, you know, liberal end, where, where it would fall on there. I guess we can uh, look at a couple things. Ted from uh, St. Irenaeus Ministries says to look at the introductions to two books to uh, give you a sense for how faithful to the text, how orthodox a particular study Bible is. And we'll look at the book of Daniel, because that's one of the first to go when they start doubting the tradition of scripture that you often see it there. It's a litmus test. So who does this, uh, these notes say wrote Daniel? Does it say? Even though scholars are divided as to when Daniel was most likely written, most agree that much of what is described in its visions applies to the cruel treatment of the Jewish people by Antiochus IV, who pressured the Jews living in Judea to abandon their faith in God. Scholars who believe Daniel was written during the exile, 6th century BC, understand the prophet's visions as predictions of events to come. Scholars who conclude that Daniel was written during the reign of Antiochus IV believe Daniel's visions were to be based on the author's experience of ongoing historical events. Either way, Daniel is a strong testimony to the strength of God. Okay, so <clears throat> doesn't uh, doesn't make a stand one way or the other. So a little wishy-washy on the authority of Daniel as the actual author of the book of Daniel. And similar test in Second Peter. A little bit too far there. This letter claims the Apostle Peter as its author. Peter was present on the mountain when Jesus' true glory was revealed, etc. Most scholars believe that this letter was written by a follower of Peter sometime after he died as a way of honoring Peter and as a way of defending the teachings of the early apostles against new opponents. Consider the following clues. The style of the book more closely reflects the Greek culture of the 2nd century AD, etc. The writer mentions Paul's letters as if they are being considered as scripture for the Christian church. Many New Testament letters looked forward to a time when Christ would soon return. Uh, but in 2 Peter, some false teachers are making fun of the Christians who hope for the Lord's return. Okay. Comparison of 2 Peter with Jude may indicate that a large part of Jude was borrowed by the author. Okay. So doesn't, uh, doesn't say for certain not written by Peter, but I would say certainly casts doubt on the Petrine authorship of Second Peter, at least. So maybe not the uh, strongest in terms of defending orthodoxy and tradition of authorship of those two books. So, you know, use that as you will. Um, the notations themselves, I find to be relatively elementary but useful for, again, someone unfamiliar with scripture and don't wade into the um, arguments of that type of uh, critical uh, scholarship. Let's compare with a few other study Bibles, just for reference. a more conservative and more orthodox in terms of uh, evangelical Protestant Christianity, the Harper Study Bible, also no longer in print, a little smaller in all dimensions, nearly as thick though. Conservative scholarship has always acknowledged that Daniel wrote this book, as the internal evidences indicate. The author identifies himself as Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He speaks of his imminent death. He also refers to the transfiguration of Christ on the holy mountain. He speaks of a previous letter and of the letters of Paul. Doesn't explicitly make the argument, but seems to support Peter as the author. 
Jerusalem Bible. Slightly smaller in one dimension width and in, uh, I guess, in thickness, maybe a little bit thinner. I won't go to those uh, notes for Daniel and Second Peter, but uh, come down heavily on the Daniel not written by Daniel at the time that Daniel lived and Second Peter almost certainly not written by Peter. The big boy, the gold standard ESV study Bible. This one's the large print and it's similar in size a little thicker even maybe than this study Bible. ESV written for a conservative Protestant audience. What do they say? The book of Daniel, named after and written by Daniel in the 6th century BC, records the events of his life and the visions that he saw from the time of his exile, etc. Not hedging at all in the ESV. Second Peter. It is reasonable in light of all the evidence and clearly supported by the claims of the letter itself to conclude that the Apostle Peter wrote Second Peter. No hedging. Good job, Crossway and ESV. And then one more out-of-print study Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I think the CSB study Bible may be still in print in terms of Holman. Similar in dimensions there. Where do they come down? They lay out both arguments. Critical view of the book of Daniel suggests it was written by a second century BC Jewish author, not the historical Daniel. This view is largely based on a naturalistic perspective that denies the possibility of the authentic foretelling found in Daniel. On the other hand, the traditional view maintains that Daniel, the prophet, did indeed write this book sometime shortly after the end of the Babylonian captivity, 6th century B.C. Doesn't explicitly say, but tends to indicate they come down on the orthodox view that Daniel was written by Daniel. Second Peter, the author of Second Peter plainly identified himself as the Apostle Peter. He called himself a Simeon Peter, a name not generally used of the Apostle elsewhere, only in Acts 15. The spelling is Semitic and lends a sense of authenticity to Peter's letter, etc., etc. Many contemporary scholars, however, reject Peter as the author of this letter. They argue, for example, the personal references to Peter's life are a literary device, etc., all of these evidences suggest that Second Peter should be accepted as authentic. So <clears throat> you can find more um, staunchly conservative Orthodox book introductions in other study Bibles, um, but it does not seem to pick sides in this particular paperback edition. Um, that aside, and the, the previously mentioned negative about the way the introductory, introductory material moves into the text without a clear demarcation, or clear enough in my book. Apart from that, I do really like this study Bible. I really do. There's just a flavor of the type of notes they have on the side to give you kind of a sense of the elementary nature of these. 
here from Mark chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, the 12 apostles. A disciple means a follower who learns from a master teacher. And the term apostle refers to a person chosen and sent by a leader to do a special job. The number of apostles, 12, is the same number as the tribes of Israel. Jesus gave these disciples the power to preach and force out evil spirits. See also Matthew 10 and Luke 6. There's a geographical type note. Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Uh, Tyre and Sidon were important non-Jewish port cities on the Mediterranean Sea in northern Palestine and what is now Lebanon. See the map on page 2375. 2,400 pages. The maps at the back aren't super impressive for a study Bible, but they're not bad at all. They're on the same type of paper, full color. Here's the index to the many articles throughout. Perhaps you can see that clearly enough to pause and read if you wish. There's also a reading the Bible reading through the themes of the Bible, so you're not reading the entire Bible, but getting a broad overview of the Bible based on the calendar, so specific readings for each day. And then there's an actual reading the Bible in a year that covers the entirety of Scripture. A little checkbox for you to mark it off, which I like that. You have someone on your uh, gift list that, or you have a young one at home, or someone who maybe um, is new to the Christian faith, or maybe their reading level is not the highest, this would be an excellent choice, I would think. Again, you can find them on all the used booksellers, uh, including eBay for 20 bucks or less delivered. Um, Mine I found for three bucks, and it was an absolute steal. Still, I'm going to end up donating it because I don't see myself using it much other than just for the enjoyment of holding it in my lap and flipping through it, which you might like also. So, um, Learning Bible, Contemporary English Version, American Bible Society, Augsburg Fortress Press, but no longer in print. So go find yourself one. Here's the... ISBN for the two editions. Flex must be the paperback that I'm holding. Hardcover. Thanks for bearing with this very long review of the Learning Bible. Hope to see you here again next time.